again, I am so glad to be here. Excuse me for, there we go. I thought I had unmuted it. In heaven, we're going to see how much time was wasted while speakers looked at their little microphone and turned it on <laughs> like that. I, I am delighted to be here. Can I just say that your church is incredibly gracious. You know, uh, in 2020, um, our meetings vaporized between March 9th and Father's Day, June 21st. I mean, they vaporized. Within a matter of a couple of days, a calendar that was full was suddenly empty. And one of the meetings that had to be rescheduled was a meeting with, here with Continental Baptist Church. But can I just say, I am so grateful for your generosity because even though we didn't have a meeting, you still graciously sent us a gift. And uh, you were the only ministry that did that. And you were so gracious, which is kudos to you. And I praise the Lord for you and for your faithfulness. And I thank the Lord, too, for your pastor and his thoroughness, always thinking things through. Appreciate that so very, very much. Well, if you uh, were around in 2020, you know that uh, this experience I'm about to describe to you was pretty common. My wife and I were together 24 hours a day, seven days a week, <laughs> for weeks on end. And we lived. We lived. I would go to look for her. I would be in my office. I'd go to look for her, and she wasn't where I last saw her. She would get up and move around. And so I would look for her in the living room, she wasn't there. Look for her in the garage, she wasn't there. Look for her in the front yard, she wasn't there. Look for her in all the rooms, she wasn't there. Look for her in the backyard. We don't have a big, a big lot of land, it's like six tenths of an acre. And there she would be in the backyard. And I would say, there you are. You know, here I am all harsh. She did nothing to earn that. There you are. I'm all frustrated. Well, look, <clears throat> the Lord spoke to my heart about that. That was the wrong way to talk to this wife that I love. And so <clears throat> I remember uh, Peter told his readers to give honor to the wife as under the weaker vessel. And so I thought, I need to talk to her differently when I find her. And so uh, when, when Peter talks about that, let me explain that. Some people say, in fact, some people would say, who you calling weaker? And I'd say, not you, ma'am. Just <laughs> don't hurt me. But the word weaker does not imply inferior at all. The idea of weaker implies something that is valued, something that is cherished. And uh, in our household, we have the Corel dishes that we would let our boys set the table with. They're virtually indestructible. We had three boys, two girls, and so the boys would set the table with that. But the girls had, our girls had a more delicate touch. And so when we had company over and we were setting the table with the, the fine dishes, the china, the, lady, the girls would set the table with that. Is that because they were inferior? Is that because those dishes were inferior? Because they were less valuable? No. It's because they were special. They were precious. They were valuable. So I thought, I need to talk to my wife that way when I find her. And so I would look for it like I was looking for treasure. Because that's what she is. She's a treasure. And then I would see her. I'd say, there you are. <clears throat> By that time, I'd forgotten why I was looking for her. <laughs> but there you are. And so that's what I do now. And, and I think she hides on purpose. <laughs> I think she hears me coming and goes to another place, you know, so that just so she could hear that. There you are. So that she knows I love you. I treasure you. S stand still. <laughs> so that's all good stuff. Hey, we are from Southern California, from the beautiful town of Yucca Valley. Beautiful Yucca Valley. That's what it said on the sign when we moved there. Beautiful Yucca Valley. That's what it said. And as you know, in Southern California, of course, we have the freeways, and we always, we always can tell a, a Californian because they always put a definite article before their freeway. Now, this is going somewhere, so stick with me. Um, we call it the I-10, the I-10, the I-5, the I-405, the 91. That's what we do. Uh, other people can tell us. They say, oh, you're from California, aren't you? How could you tell? Because you to said you drove up here on the 25. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just 25. Um, but a friend of mine was traveling down the 91. It's a corridor that goes from, from the beach cities into the Inland Empire in Southern California. You may be familiar with it. It goes through Orange County, Riverside, and, and San Bernardino. And on the 91, traffic was flowing. Beautiful Southern California day. Windows are rolled down. My friend's driving down the freeway. And down, down a ways, he could see it. There is some kind of an acrobatic display going on in the air. It is a white grocery bag, a t-shirt bag, 
floating around in the air in the freeway. And so he's driving down D91, and he notices a car goes by, and a swoosh of air carries that bag over to the left. Another car goes by, a swoosh of air pushes that bag over to the right, to the left, to the right. And so it's just going back and forth. It hits somebody's antenna, and then it just screams to be released as it goes, and then it's released. The amazing thing for that, this, this, this stuns Californians because somebody paid 10 cents for that bag that's <laughs> floating all over. <clears throat> My friend noticed the bag was coming to his lane. He noticed that it was coming to his side of the car. He noticed it was coming to the driver's side mirror. And as it passed by him, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, he reached out and grabbed that bag and pulled it into his vehicle, and he thought, that was epic. <laughs> I grabbed the bag, that was epic. He thought, nobody's gonna believe me. I have nobody in the car, nobody's gonna believe me. I wonder if anybody else noticed about that time, a guy on a motorcycle rode right up, right up parallel with my friend, he looked at my friend and gave him a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, that was epic, that was epic. Now the thing about that epic moment is it didn't change anybody's life. I mean, it was epic for my friend, but did, well, okay, it did change our life somewhat. When my wife and I are driving down the freeway, if we see a bag, the windows are coming down. <laughs> We're coming down. But I got to thinking about that. When you think about it, how many details had to fall into place for my friend to be able to reach out and grab that bag? We can't create an epic moment, but we can do this. We can purpose to be alert to them, to be aware of them, to watch for them. And we can purpose to grab onto them when they come our way, to grab onto them, to be alert, and then to seize the opportunity. But all the details, I mean, if he was going a little bit slower or a little bit faster, would have missed the bag. If he'd have been in a light a little longer or left the light a little earlier, if he had left work a little earlier, a little later, he'd have missed the bag. But then I think about this, when it comes to spiritual things, there are all sorts of details that the, this marvelous God that we know and love, that he puts into place. I mean, all kinds of details. Uh, why is it that we live where we live? Why is it that we have the neighbors that we have? Why is it that, that we are in proximity to this church? Why is it that I'm sitting in the very spot that I'm sitting in? Why is it that I'm in the very role that I'm in? And I tell you, I believe that God this morning wants to bring some truth our way. And if we're alert to it, we could by faith grab it and bring it into our lives. And I believe God wants to do that. Amen. I believe he wants to do that. <clears throat> May I direct your attention to the Gospel of John in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. One of the biggest difficulties we have in sharing the Gospel, one of the biggest difficulties we have in sharing the Gospel is the difficulty of perceptions. Perceptions. Because for me, my perception is reality. That's my reality. But for me to, to turn to Christ, for me to see my need of Christ, to see that how, how that he was the only answer, God had to pierce through all of those perceptions. You heard about the lady up in Fresno that came out of a grocery store, had a purse on her hand, two bags of groceries in her arms. She was going to her car. The doors were open. She dropped her groceries to the ground. Her son had given her a handgun for protection. She pulled it out of her purse. She waved it at those men. Here were her words exactly. Get out of that car. I have a gun. I will not hesitate to use it. Those four guys scattered to the four different directions of the wind, man. Poof, they were gone. She picked up her groceries, shaking still, put them in the back seat of the car, went to put her car in the ignition, and it wouldn't start. The key would not turn. And she thought, oh, great. Somebody, some people tried to steal my car, and now my car doesn't work. She looked a few rows down. No cars parked there. She looked a few rows down, and there, in the third space from her, was a car that looked exactly like the one she was sitting in. <laughs> and she realized her mistake. Picked up her groceries. Keys opened up that car put her groceries in the back, started right up, drove herself down to the police station. <laughs> Figured she better confess to what she had done. So the desk sergeant just laughed. She said, I don't see what's so funny. He said, look down at the end of the counter. Sure enough, there were four men. They looked familiar to her. <laughs> they, they came to report an 85-year-old carjacking grandma. Because <laughs> remember, her words were not, get out of my car. It was, get out of that car. Her perception was totally wrong. 
It was totally wrong. That that was her car. But that wasn't the time to set the record straight. But it was totally, totally mistaken. We've all been in situations like that. But it's especially dangerous when it's in spiritual matters. If a father and son were walking down the a Jerusalem street in the first century, the boy, maybe 10 years old, he and dad are having a conversation because fathers and sons, they have conversations. And the boy says, hey, daddy, what do I have to do to see heaven? What do I have to do to go to heaven? Well, the dad wants a right answer. And so he's thinking and he spots a fellow. He says, son, I want you to notice across the marketplace, notice across the street there, there's a guy on the other side of the street, a little taller than other people. But I want you to notice some things. Uh, let, me, let me point him out to you. His beard is cut differently than anybody else's. Along his temples are those, are those sideburns that he has not trimmed. I want you to notice what he's wearing. The garment that he's wearing has tassels along the bottom. You can kind of see them in between people's legs as they move about, but there are tassels there. When he raises his arm to point at something, I want you to notice that on his arm is a leather box. And that leather box has some straps, leather straps attached to it. That box contains scripture. And before that man tied that box to his arm, he pressed it against his lips several times to show reverence for the scriptures. And then he tied that to his arm. He always wants the scriptures at hand. That guy, when he gets up in the morning, he doesn't say, what do I want to eat? He says, what does God's word allow me to eat? What does God's law allow me to eat? He doesn't go to the closet and say, what do I want to wear? It's instead, what does God's law let me wear? Well, son, that guy walks the walk. He doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. That guy's been recognized by his peers. He's part of the religious quality control of our region called the Sanhedrin. That guy's a ruler of the Jews. That guy keeps one day out of seven as the Sabbath. He is so fastidious about the Sabbath. He will not carry anything that weighs more than a dried fig, lest he carry a weight and break the Sabbath. He will carry no more liquid than what could be held in a mouthful of goat's milk. If he runs out of water, he can't go to his well and lower, lower a rope down and pull up a bucket. That would be working on the Sabbath. That would be breaking the Sabbath. Oddly enough, his wife could take her apron strings and tie it to the bucket and lower it down. But that guy's fastidious. Son, if you want to go to heaven, you got to be like that guy. That guy's name is Nicodemus. And you know, as, as sincere as that father would want to be, as sincere and impassioned as his words are, that father's answer is 100% wrong. But his answer would reflect what we hear today. <coughs> you know, if our grandchild said, hey, Grandpa, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Well, you know, you got to go to church and you got to be religious and you can't hurt anybody and uh, you probably should give to the church. And as sincere as that is, that perception is thoroughly incorrect when we look at the Word of God. Thoroughly incorrect. Yes, we ought to go to church, but we don't, we don't go to church to go to heaven. We ought to be nice to our neighbor, but we don't do that to go to heaven. You know, we, we, there are all sorts of things that we ought to do, but we don't do that to go to heaven. Well, Nicodemus, Nicodemus has something gnawing at his heart, and he wants an answer. Look what John 3, 1 says. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So Nicodemus has a few things that we know immediately right off the bat. He is a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the strict law keepers of that day. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was part of the Sanhedrin, part of the quality control when it came to religious affairs there in the land. And the Bible says here that his name was Nicodemus. What a great name. Now, I think names have meanings. A lot of names have meanings. Um, I have five children, four, three boys and two girls. We have the first one is Timothy. Uh, that means God honoring. Second is uh, Rachel. That means little lamb. Uh, we named our second born son Second Timothy, just right after the books of the Bible. And <laughs> we did it. Would have been a lot easier. But we named him Thomas, which means twin. Thomas means twin. And uh, Thomas isn't a twin, but our boy has twins. He has twins. In fact, pray for him and his wife, Alyssa. They have two sets of twins. Four years old and like six months old. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy, I tell you. He's, man, so, but they're doing a great job there. And then our next born is Rebecca. Her name means ensnarer, ensnarer, one who sets traps. Of course, our desire was that she would, you know, win people to the Lord and that thing. And then our, um, our youngest boy is Jonathan, Jonathan, which means gift from God. My wife's name is Terry, which means caring one. Uh, my name is Rob, which means to steal. <laughs> I 
it's biblical. It says, rob not the poor. Actually, it comes from Robert, and, uh, and Bob mentioned this to me. This morning, it means bright fame. I think of Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And so uh, God, you know, God, through my parents, gave me that name, interestingly enough. And, and uh, what a delight it is just to be able to preach the word of God. Nicodemus comes from two words. First of all, Nike. We all know what that means. Nike, we've seen that. It means conqueror. It means victor. And then the second part of his name, Demas, comes from our word for demographics. So his parents, when they named him, named him Conqueror of the People. And you take a look at his status and his, his elevation, his recognition by his peers, and he indeed is on the fast track to success. But Nicodemus may be a ruler over people, but there's something in his heart that's just not getting answered. He has memorized all kinds of portions of Scripture in Hebrew. He has memorized all kinds of portions of the law, could quote it to you. Uh, he, he is one who walks the walk, not just talks the talk. But in his heart, there's this gnawing sense that there's got to be something more. Because with all of his law keeping, with all of his Sabbath keeping, with all of his memorization of the scriptures, with all of his regiment, with all of the rites, and with all of the rituals, Nicodemus has no assurance whatsoever of seeing the kingdom of heaven. He has no assurance whatsoever that to leave this life and move into the next would move him into heaven. And so one night, one dark night, he makes his way down the back streets of Jerusalem. And he goes to the place where he heard that Jesus and the disciples would be staying. And he gets himself out of his house. And there's this gnawing all the way there. And he gets to the place. Maybe he sees the, the fire. And he goes to the place where Jesus is supposed to be. And when he comes to Jesus, he says some nice things. Some nice things, which tells us he's not coming to Jesus as a hostile. He's not coming there to ensnare him or to trap him or to get him to say something that, that he can use later on to trap Jesus and accuse him. But all these things he says are friendly. Notice what it says in verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night. Some say to hide his actions. I say no to have a protect, protracted conversation. Why, at night you don't have all the appointments, you don't have all the clamoring of the crowds. At night you can have a lengthy conversation without interruption. And I wonder if that's why he came by night. And the Bible says that he came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher sent from God, or come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Boy, the things he says are very kind. He calls him rabbi. That's a term of respect. It means teacher. It's master. Rabbi. That's a term of respect. He doesn't call him a false teacher. doesn't call him one of the sons of Beelzebub or uh, accuse him of being in league with the devil. He calls him rabbi. And then he says, we know. And he uses that pronoun we. I think that's fascinating. There's a group of us. We know that you are come from God. And, and we know this because you have God's stamp of approval all over your ministry. No man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. Those are very kind things to say, but they stop short. They're very kind, but they stop short. They stop short of the truth. Because Jesus is more than a teacher. He's more than a man come from God. And he's more than one who was doing miracles, having God's stamp of approval on his ministry. And I love what Jesus does. Nicodemus says these nice things to Jesus. And I want you to notice Jesus does not even acknowledge them. Jesus never wastes a word. He never says, um, trying to think of what to think of. He never, he, he never says, uh, uh, uh. And he never uses words for filler. He never uses words to take up space. Everything is deliberate. And after Nicodemus says these nice things to him, notice what Jesus says in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I wonder if under the surface of all those nice things that Nicodemus said, I wonder if under the surface Jesus looked right into his heart and he says, I know why you came, Nicodemus. You're wrestling with this business of the kingdom of God. You have no assurance that you're going to see it. Well, I'm going to go right past all those nice things that you said that stopped short of reality. I'm going to go past those things. I'm going to go, I'm going to go right to the, your heart. Nicodemus, here's the answer you're looking for. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus is now puzzled because Nicodemus feels like he doesn't need to be born again. He was familiar with this idea of a new birth because people who were Gentiles that came into the Hebrew faith 
were said to have experienced a new birth. So he was familiar with that idea. But Nicodemus was already born in the nation of Israel. He was already a Hebrew. He was already of one of the tribes. He was already locked on when it came to the law. And so he says, can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus makes it clear that there are two births. The nature of the first birth is that it's a birth of flesh born out of water. The nature of the second birth is it's a birth of spirit. And that's what we see here in these verses as we continue. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then notice verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Notice this. He says, thee, that's a singular pronoun. That's talking to an individual. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. But he uses a plural. He says, ye must be born again. Those guys that you're talking to, those guys that you're talking to that you agree, we say that, uh, we say that uh, no man can, uh, we say that you are a man come from God. We say that no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. He says, you tell those fellows back there with yourself, you all need to be born again. Now, I don't know why it is we make this so complicated. It's so mystical. Because Jesus continues on to describe just exactly what that involves. Notice what the Bible says. It, by the way, it's a spiritual thing. It's, it's like the wind. It's like the wind. You and I can't see where the wind begins. We can't see where it ends. We can't even see the wind. We know the wind is there by what it moves. That's how we know there's wind. You and I may not see the process that God, where God begins to bring somebody to Christ. We may not see what happens in the heart, but you can tell what happens by the response. You can tell what happens by the response. Jesus clarifies for this, and I just, I just love this. Look down here in verse, in verse 14, same chapter. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Same context, context of being born again. And Jesus directs Nicodemus' attention to the book of Numbers. That would be for us Numbers chapter 21. And in the book of Numbers, there's the account of Israel, and God is leading them, God's providing for them, but they're complaining. And so God chastens them. He disciplines them. He sends in their midst these fiery serpents that start biting people and people start dying. And then the people understand how grievous their complaining is. And they go to Moses and they repent. And they ask Moses to go to God to remove this, this uh, discipline. And Moses goes to God. And God tells Moses to do something never told him to do before. You make out of a serpent, you, actually you make out of brass a serpent. You make out of brass a snake. You put it on a pole. Anybody that looks at the serpent gets healed of the bite. Anybody that simply looks at the serpent gets healed of the bite. Anybody that looks at the serpent gets healed of the bite. You can imagine. Little girl, her daddy's dying of a fever, been bitten by one of these serpents. And she says to her, to her, to her dad, hey, dad, Moses says if you just go out and look at the serpent, you can be healed of this. He says, oh, no, I got to do something else. I got to give a sacrifice. To look is just too easy. I have to do something. I have to do something. That's arrogance. I have to do something. That's pride. I have to do something to earn this healing of the snake bite. No, Daddy. Moses said all you have to do is go out and look at the, look at the serpent on the pole, and you'll be healed. That was God's word. So, and, and to add to what God has said would be to be disrespectful to God. To believe anything less than what God had said would be to be disrespectful to God. But God told the people, if you go out and look at the serpent, you could be healed. And the Bible here, Jesus is saying that was not only true then, it was also prophetic. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he's prophesying regarding his crucifixion, by what type of death he should die. And notice the parallel. The idea then is to look to him. Look to him for deliverance. Look to him for healing. Look to him for salvation. And he clarifies this as he goes on. Look what verse 15 says. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal. And then notice verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Life. I'm going to tell you, if Nicodemus is going to see the kingdom of God, there are going to be two changes and a choice. 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 Say that with me. Two changes and a choice. And if any of us are going to see the kingdom of God, there have to be two changes and a choice. Number one, Nicodemus had to change his, had to change his mind about himself. He needed to change his mind about himself. 
Because if, if we're going to be made right with God, we need to understand God's, um, God's uh, judgment, God's assessment, God's evaluation of where we are. And most of the time, as human beings, we can be arrogant and we can think we're doing pretty good because we always compare ourselves with people that are doing worse than we are. But the comparison is actually against God's righteousness, God's holiness, and God's perfection. And Nicodemus realized, even, even though he was one of the most religious people of his day, he realized there's got to be something more. He needed to change his mind about himself and understand that his religiousness was not enough, and it never would be. His religiousness, his keeping of the law could do nothing to diminish sin's stain. His, his keeping the law could do nothing to make him in right standing with God. So Nicodemus needed to change his mind about himself. I grew up in Huntington Beach, California. Went to Huntington Beach High School. In our sophomore year of high school, it was mandated that we had to take life-saving. Life-saving, because we lived near the beach, so we had to take life-saving. I don't know what they do in Palm Springs. Maybe it's desert training. But in Huntington Beach, it was life-saving. You'll have to take this by faith. I was like 135 pounds, just as thin as a rail. And I wasn't real assertive, and so... We all had to like partner up. All of us, all those guys had to find somebody to save or save us. And there were, and I, I got the largest kid in the class. They taught us how to jump into the water, keeping our eye contact on the one that's in distress. They taught us how to swim out to that person in distress. They taught us how to turn that person, how to get a hold of them, and how to swim back to a place of safety. But they warned us when you get into the water <coughs> and you go out to the person that's in distress, look out, be prepared, they're gonna fight you. Because they think you are there to add to their distress. They think that y'all are going to drown. And so they will fight you. Sometimes then you have to wait until they get worn out. Sometimes they, they may go unconscious. But sometimes you just got to wait till they get worn out. And I'm going to tell you the religious man is exactly the same way. And I've seen it again and again and did it even in my own life. Somebody would, you know, somebody would ask, hey, are you going to heaven? Well, yeah, aren't you? You know, hey, we're, we go to church. Uh, we read our Bible. Uh, yeah, yeah. The hardest thing to do is to get a drowning person to just let go, to be rescued. The hardest thing to do is to get a religious person. And the more religious we are, the more arrogant we become. The more religious we are, the more arrogant we become. But Nicodemus needed to change his mind about himself. The second thing he needed to change his mind about was the Savior. He needed to see, Nicodemus needed to see himself as thoroughly inadequate. And he needed to see that Jesus was thoroughly sufficient. Thoroughly. It would be through his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, he would pay the price for our sin. He would die in our place. The death we deserved, he would die in our place. He would be separated from the Father. That's a separation you and I deserve. But Jesus would do that. So Nicodemus needed to change his mind and see Jesus was more than a rabbi. A rabbi, yes, but more than that. A man sent from God, yes, but more than that. A man that had God's stamp of approval all over his ministry, yes, but more than that. He's the God-man. He's the one who is God wrapped in the flesh, wrapped in flesh. Lived a sinless life that he might atone for our sins, that he might die in our place. And he was buried and rose from the grave. And so Nicodemus needed to change his mind about the Savior. By the way, I think we see evidences that Nicodemus did. When it came time to pluck Jesus' body off the cross, there were two guys there, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And Nicodemus brought something with him. He brought a hundred pounds of ointment in order to anoint the body of Jesus. The Jews in, in those days, the Jews buried differently than the Egyptians. Egyptians embalmed. Um, and in other, in other cultures, they would uh, cremate. But in the Jewish culture, uh, they, didn't, they didn't put grave clothes on in order to embalm, but simply to preserve from the, from the um, residual results of corruption, to preserve from the odor and all of that. And so they would, they would have, so Nicodemus brought 100 pounds of paste for that process. So Nicodemus needed to change his mind about himself and about Jesus. And then there was a choice, two changes and a choice. He needed to change his mind about himself, see that he was completely inadequate to please God enough to go to heaven. He needed to change his mind about Jesus, see that Jesus was thoroughly sufficient, and Jesus is God's answer for getting to heaven. 
And then he needed to make a choice. He couldn't just believe these things intellectually. He needed to make a choice, and that choice is referred to in verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's right on the heels of verse 15, where Jesus said the same thing. It all hinges on what we do with Jesus. It all hinges with what we do with Jesus. Do we believe on him, or do we not? Do we believe on him, or do we not? Before the chapter ends, oh, there's another guy that enters into the scene, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, John the Baptist picks up the message that Jesus was preaching and begins to preach it. And I want you to notice right at the end of verse of, of, of chapter 3, notice right at the end of, verse, uh, of chapter 3, verse 36, verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Here we go again, that choice to believe, that choice to believe. And, and John says, if a person believes on Christ... There's eternal life. But when I don't believe on him, if I choose not to believe on him, he says, the wrath of God abides over me. That word abide means to remain. That wherever I go, it's as though God is holding back his wrath over my head. What is that wrath? Remember, the wrath of God is not arbitrary. The wrath of God is not random. The wrath of God is absolutely just, absolutely deserved, and never, never a bit more than needed, never a bit less than needed. God's wrath is very measured. And our sin is not something he excuses. Our sin is something that incenses him. We've disobeyed him. We've disobeyed his laws. We've broken his commands. We've done things he said not to. We've not done things he's commanded us to do. We, we, and so there's the, the wrath of God that abides over us, but, but it's held back by his hand. And the reason why it hasn't dropped on us is because God is long-suffering and patient. God loves the rebel. God loves the wretch. God loves the wayward. And he's not willing that any should perish. And when you think of all the circumstances that brought us into this building today, when you think of all the circumstances that brought us into this building today, is there someone, is there someone sitting here that, that God's wrath is abiding over you? And you would say today, you know what I need to do? I, I've been wrestling with this. I need to believe on Jesus. At the end of our time together, at the end of our time together, at the end of our time in the Word of God, we're going to have an opportunity to make a choice, an opportunity to believe on Christ. Because it, we'd be remiss if we took all the time to move through what the Bible says on this, because we're dealing with eternal matters, and then just say, well, there it is. Have a nice day. Go your own merry way without giving us an opportunity to believe on Christ. I remember I was, uh, I was uh, 10 years old, and I, my mom and dad, they went to a church that didn't preach the gospel. They went to a church that did not preach the gospel. Nice people as people go, but no gospel message whatsoever. Nothing about the death, burial, and the resurrection and the need to be saved. And so... That's very dissatisfying, so they, they were laying out of church. And a guy came in my neighborhood, came to my neighborhood, that was starting a bus route to go to church. And he had a pocket full of double bubble bubble gum. And he was my friend. And he said, hey, kids, let's go talk to your parents, see if they'll let you come to church. And so he, he went and talked to my parents, and my parents let me and my sisters go to church on the bus. That was glorious. That was glorious. They may have seen it as free babysitting. I really don't care what their motive was. I'm just glad they let me go to a church that preached the gospel. And so we went to, I went there. Uh, I went there. Uh, the first Sunday I went, my best friend was on the bus with me too because he liked bubblegum too. And so we're on the bus and we're sitting in children's church and they talk about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And they talk about how to be saved. And they talk about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, we're going to give you an opportunity to believe on the Lord. All you have to do when, when we bow our heads and close our eyes, all you have to do is slip out to the nearest aisle. We have somebody who will take a Bible and show you how you can believe on Jesus and be saved. And I thought, man, I want that. But, but I've got my best friend here, Wayne. You know what? If Wayne goes, I'll go. If Wayne goes, I'll go. And Wayne didn't go. And all week long, I thought, man, I should have gone. I'm tired of wrestling with this. I should have gone. I know I'm not right with God. You know, the Spirit of God was doing a work in my heart. So we go the second time. I said, boy, I hope Wayne goes this time. I hope he goes. He didn't go. And we're going home on the bus, and I'm thinking to myself, next week I'm coming back. I'm going to go and find out even if Wayne doesn't go. Whether Wayne goes or not, I don't care. I am going. 
I want to find out. And sure enough, third week, they present the gospel. They said, if you'd like to believe on Jesus to be your Savior, if you'd like to receive him as your Savior, well, you could slip out to the side. I said, I don't care if Wayne's going or not. I'm going. And I went. And I looked and Wayne was behind me. He was waiting for me to go. We could have settled that two weeks earlier. <laughs> and this guy, this uh, mountain of a man, six feet, two inches tall, a, a peace officer there in Orange County, he took a Bible, he took us all into a little side room, about 10 of us guys. We sat on these little chairs, little preschool chairs. And this big old guy sat down on a little preschool chair. It was kind of comical to see. And he opened the Bible and he went through basically what I just shared with you. How that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, the person sitting in your seat, the dr person sitting in your car, the person driving down your lane, God's bringing this truth your way. Whosoever believeth on him, man, we need to by faith grab that and pull it into our lives. And boy, I remember in that little room, that guy was talking to us about this. And here's what he said. He said, fellas, if you want to, you could pray to receive Jesus as your savior right now. And I thought, man, I'm 10 years old. I don't know how to pray. And then he said this. If you'd like to me, like me to lead you in prayer, I'd like to pray with you. And I thought, I'm on board with that. Lead away. And he led us boys in prayer so that we could receive Jesus as our Savior. It wasn't a magical prayer, mystical, just based on Bible truth. The key was that we believed what the Bible said. Remember, there's an account uh, in the book of Acts. You may not be familiar with, with it if you're new to the Bible, but there's a, a jailhouse filled with prisoners. And in the innermost part are men that were beaten, Paul and Silas. And they were beaten. And as they're in the fetters, after having been beaten, all night long they're singing and they're praising God. And, in the, and then in that night there's an earthquake. That place rattles, shakes the, the, the cell doors off of their hinges. It's so huge, it shakes the fetters off the feet of the apostles. The jailer bursts in. Now, he has purchased the right to be the jailer. And he knows if any of those prisoners escape, he has let Rome down. The penalty for that is death. So he goes in, he assumes, man, if I was in this prison, I'd be running for my life. But he assumes they've, they've all run and he starts to take his own life, starts to take his own life, falling on his sword. And Paul says, no, wait, wait, wait. We're all here. None of us have left. Somebody brings in a light and they shine it in the faces of each of those prisoners. Nobody has left. And that old jailer heard Paul sing in that prison. He heard Paul talk to others. And God had been working in that jailer's heart. And he asks Paul this question, what must I do to be saved? And some people think, well, he was talking about being saved from the earthquake. He was talking about like being saved from the Roman judgment if any prisoner. Really? Then Paul's answer makes no sense. He was talking about how to be saved from his sins because Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Today, November the 14th, 2021, 14th, ought to be somebody's day of salvation. Amen. I can't help but believe God's speaking to somebody's heart here today. My time is gone. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give you a chance to trust Christ. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment. Heavenly